Welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar. We're so pleased you could join us. We're going to talk about community wastewater reuse with high rate algal ponds. And this will be our third webinar in the series. Professor Howard Fallowfield from Flinders University is with us and we're so glad he could also join us. My name is Trevor Pillar. I'm the National Partnership Manager here at ISWARM and these Australian Water School webinars have attracted a large amount of interest, as you can see on the map there, from Australia, across India, Europe, and South America, Africa. We've got tons of webinars coming up uh, in the near, near future. There's a ton more behind these, but that, there's a few there already coming up. But if you want to see all of our webinars from the past a few months and a few years, subscribe to that YouTube. And I think Joel, my colleague Joel, are we putting that on the um, on the chat line as we speak? All right, today, uh, Professor Fallowfield is a microbial ecologist and a coordinator of research higher degrees in Flinders University. And he focuses on the health aspects of water quality, has been doing so for many years and with some successful research projects, design and operation of high rate algal ponds. Thanks, Howard. It's, it's great to, to have you with us today and a joy once again after this many years of working together and uh, seeing your science uh, now coming out into such fantastic opportunities for creating, creating good irrigation water from wastewater. So without anything more to say, I'm going to hand right over to you. Howard, join us. Okay. I'd like to uh, thank Trevor and Joel for organizing the uh, the technology to do this and for the invitation from Icewarm to present the, uh, right. the third uh, presentation on high rate ponds. Yeah. And uh, the plan is to take you uh, back a bit in history just to make sure we're all on the same page to start and then uh, just uh, inform people really of the progress that we've made in, in this system and also to get a discussion going. It's great to see uh, so many people from uh, around the world interested in this topic. So without any more ado, I'll, um, I'll start. So just to recap, in South Australia, in uh, rural communities outside the, um, the, urban, the metropolitan centre of Adelaide, uh, largely wastewater treatment is the domain of uh, district councils. Uh, communities tend uh, to use on-site treatment systems initially, things like uh, septic tanks, um, aerobic treatment systems, etc. Uh, but where we have an issue with either a poor soil water type. So when we talk about a septic tank, we, we're looking at a, a house with the, the laundry, the bathroom, shower, kitchen attached to the, the tank. The tank uh, in South Australia is uh, required to be normally about 3,000 litres, 24 hour detention time. And the advantage there is we get uh, quite high suspended solids removal and high BOD removal. And then the liquid phase, normally for an on-site treatment system, is then uh, reticulated or put through a soakage trench and it, it basically soaks into the into the ground uh, for disposal of the treated effluent. Um, where we have problems either with soil type, that is um, sandy soils with very high infiltration rates and the potential for groundwater contamination, that's a, a public a potential public health issue if the groundwater is being used for drinking water or for um, horticulture, vegetable irrigation. And then the opposite is also true where we have uh, very high clay content soils. Uh, they get saturated during a, a rain, rain period in the winter. And they, then there's a danger of uh, runoff of uh, contaminated rain, rainwater contaminated with wastewater from the soakage trench entering into uh, sensitive water courses, uh, particularly in this case in South Australia, the, uh, the River Murray, which has already experienced uh, huge uh, cyanobacterial blooms and poor water quality. In that case, where we have those two, two conditions, normally we would put in a standard, uh, the tradition has been to put in a standard waste stabilization pond. And I spoke about the issues of those in the previous two seminars, and I'm not proposing to go through the issues with um, the standard, usually 1.2 to 1.4 meter deep pond system with a facultative pond and four maturation ponds. They have a residence time of something like 66 days required by the South Australian Department of Health, which means we have very large, large lagoons that are expensive to construct. What we've been looking at is the, the application of the high rate algal pond to these community wastewater treatment systems. And the idea is that the, the pipe to the soakage trench is cut and the, the wastewater is then reticulated to a high rate algal pond. Uh, high rate algal ponds are shallow systems to improve um, the light climate for uh, wastewater treatment and algal growth. They're mixed by a simple paddle wheel, which rotates usually about 12, 14 RPM in the, in the pond systems, but mainly to give a, um, 
mean liquid surface velocity of about uh, 0.2 meters a second. Retention times are generally between five and 10 days. And we get treatment in that time and it significantly reduces the surface area required for wastewater treatment in these sustainable pond systems. And that reduces evaporative loss because the water's not sitting out for 66 days. It means that we have more water for reuse in communities that are sensitive to water availability. And the uh, reduced residence time also means that we have about a 40 to 50 percent decrease in capital cost um, for construction of the systems. The system I'm going to be talking about that we've worked on, which has largely been our research system, which was uh, kindly funded by the Local Government Association of South Australia and the District Council of Loxton Wakery. That this system is about 250 kilometres north of Adelaide on the uh, banks of the, of the River Murray. It's a population of between 150 and 300. It changes because of uh, seasonal fruit picking and backpackers coming into work. And the pond system you're looking at is about uh, 250 square meters of uh, open water. And you can see in the picture on the right, there's actually two ponds uh, mixed by, by paddle wheel. So in this, in this system, the water has been pre-treated in septic tanks. The liquid phase has been reticulated to the high rate pond. And uh, recently, we've also converted the high rate pond to uh, solar power with batteries. So it can be operated um, off grid, just using solar panels and the battery, which is important if we want to move into more uh, remote communities where we wouldn't have um, power. So these are the workhorses of the uh, treatment system. This is a, a shot of um, a micrograph of the assemblage that you see in a high rate pond. And what's interesting about this is it's got the, the standard, uh, what I would call the weed species of algae. The, we don't inoculate the ponds. These organisms turn up in the wastewater. You can see things like chlorella, a few diatoms and senodesmus. But also what's interesting is these aren't free planktonic algae as single cells. They're usually embedded in a matrix. And that matrix comprises of uh, bacteria, fungi, some protozoa. But you can see that the algae and that matrix are in close association, and that's an important component of the uh, of the of the treatment system or the the mechanisms of treatment. Now I showed this uh, slide last time, but I'm I'm just going to go through it again. So the the, the, the this cycle, if you like, this um, commensalism, or uh, if that's the correct word, that goes on in the pond is really important. So we start off and we start at the top with algal photosynthesis, which is green microalgae like chlorella. During the daytime, they will uh, photosynthesize, produce oxygen. We get very high levels of um, saturation in mid-afternoon. Uh, that oxygen is used by the, the heterotrophic bacteria naturally present in the wastewater. And the organic carbon, which we often describe as BOD, that is broken down by heterotrophic uh, growth and respiration. And if you like, in return, the heterotrophic bacteria respire carbon dioxide which is used by the algae for photosynthesis and fixation and growth. And that take up of, of carbon dioxide and photosynthesis, photosynthesis itself, and also if we're using nitrate as the nitrogen source in the pond, will lead to an elevated uh, daytime pH. And that pH might get up to between eight and 11. So that's the, that's the heart of the cycle. And there's, there's more information in a review we published in 2017, the references at the bottom of the slide. Now, there's a role of mixing in a higher algal pond. So we're, we're talking here about a water depth of 0.3 to 0.5 meters. Uh, we have three sources of uh, three wavelengths of UV come from sunlight. UVC doesn't uh, penetrate through the Earth's atmosphere. That's important to note because um, UVC is the wavelength that's often used in, uh, in high pressure vapor lamps for um, disinfection in laboratories and in other water systems. We don't see that coming through the atmosphere. It doesn't play any role in disinfection in the high rate pond. What we do see are two wavelengths, UVA and UVB. They have different uh, depths of penetration through a turbid water. And research that Natalie Bolton did in uh, 2012, we measured attenuation of these wavelengths. Um, and we use, uh, we believe that UVB is effective to about uh, 0.03 of a meter and UVA penetrates because it's longer wavelength, it penetrates further through the water, it's disinfection capability, that's about um, seven centimeters, excuse me. <coughs> and then we've got visible light, which also plays a minor role in disinfection, but nonetheless, it still has a role to play. Um, by mixing, we actually have two, two or three main effects. The first one is 
because we're mixing, we don't get thermal stratification, pH stratification, and DO stratification, which is a problem that happens in uh, the 1.4 meter deep uh, maturation ponds and facultative ponds. And that stratification means that we have a temperature partitioning, pH partitioning, and also very mixed microbiology in that we have aerobic microbiology and potentially facultative anaerobic microbiology going on in the same pond, which makes it very difficult to, to model and understand the processes. So a homogeneous pond is a good pond in my view. And also because we're mixing, we are circulating the organisms of concern, the pathogens and the indicators we use to assess the presence of those pathogens. We circulate that through these um, disinfection depths, if you like, where the UVA, UVB penetrates, and we increase the rate of exposure to disinfecting UV uh, wavelengths, and we get higher rates of, uh, higher die-off rates, higher rates of removal because of that in a shallow pond system. Not only UVA and UVB has a role to play, organisms also are influenced by pH and dissolved oxygen. And this is a recently we've now got uh, really high level remote sensing uh, up at uh, Kingston on Murray. Um, and we can get this downloaded onto our mobile phones and we can look at what's happening if the move takes you. And what we're looking at here is down the side, we have um, the uh, parts per million of dissolved oxygen and we also have pH. So the dissolved oxygen is uh, on the blue and the pH is on the black. And you can see the diurnal variation. So this is caused by um, the, the, the troughs are nighttime when there's no photosynthesis, no oxygen production. And as the pond goes on its merry way through the day, the pH climbs to a peak at about around about three o'clock in the afternoon, usually peak pH, and then goes through these cycles over and over again. And of course, high pH is a, um, is, uh, a has a disinfecting role in itself in terms of things like E. coli. And dissolved oxygen also plays a role in UVA and UVB disinfection. We're going to talk just a bit of having, having looked at that, um, that a circular process, if you like, of algal photosynthesis linked to heterotrophic bacterial degradation of organic carbon. And the areas of wastewater treatment, obviously, are we're looking at nutrient removal, BOD removal, and looking at pathogen removal or disinfection for wastewater reuse. And I suppose the question I get asked firstly is, we, People want to know the processes that are involved in these systems and you know a bit of explanation about why they work. So first off, looking at um, microalgal nutrient removal. Well, of course, we can, um, we can see nitrogen and phosphorus as being really um, liquid fertilizer, readily available in wastewater. Uh, if we look at the equation at the top there, that's a generalized equation for photosynthesis involving sunlight, carbon dioxide, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then there's a, a molar equation there for microalgal biomass. And you can see there's 16 atoms of nitrogen and one of phosphorus being taken up and 106 atoms of carbon being taken up. So a lot of the removal uh, is uptake by the algae and bacteria as they grow in the system using the nitrogen and phosphorus available in the, in the wastewater. Um, we regularly see up to 90% removal of nitrogen. We do get seasonal changes. It goes to about 70% in the winter. And that's the graph on the right hand side with percentage nitrogen removal and uh, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A being the green pigment, an indirect measurement of algal biomass. And you can see in that work that was done you know, embarrassingly long time ago in 1999, the relationship between the amount of algae you've got in the pond and the percentage of nitrogen removed, which indicates it's been um, transformed into the biomass. But there are other processes involved as well. So the ammonia coming into our system will be variously, usually around about 80 milligrams a, a liter coming in from the septic tank. And the high pH that I've already shown you, the high diurnal pH, of course, influences the um, stoichiometry between ammonium, NH4, and ammonia, NH3. And at the higher pH, that balance, that equilibrium is shifted towards NH3, which means then you've got a, um, a volatile ammonia, which can... Uh, escape the pond at that high pH. So we do lose um, um, ammonia due to volatilization at the high pHs uh, present in the pond. You can variously see that as a bad thing if you want to, if you want to preserve the, um, the nitrogen and reuse it for plant growth, but it's a process that takes place in, the, in these systems. I think we probably understand um, nitrogen removal uh, better than we do phosphorus removal in these systems. So you can see from that equation, we're only getting one, one uh, mole of phosphorus being taken up, one atom of phosphorus being taken up in the mole of microalgal biomass. 
So uh, uptake is a role, but I think also there's a significant role in those flocks that I showed you, those, those mixtures of the algae and the bacteria in that matrix, that there's the role for uh, precipitation of phosphorus in those flocks. And this, that equation I've shown there is really the standard equation for struvite production, which is influenced by magnesium and ammonia and phosphorus present. It's also influenced by calcium and pH. And I think that's a, a, a rich area for uh, more research and, uh, and understanding in the relative role of uptake as opposed to precipitation within the flocular biomass for phosphorus removal. And when you look at uh, both publications we've, we've produced and publications that have been produced by others working in the field, you see a much broader range of phosphorus removal percentages. Uh, so ours at KOM, uh, Kingston on Murray, would be about 20%, which is pretty poor, whereas we have seen them as large as 60%. And I think that in part is due to the nature of the possible water being consumed and the balance of magnesium, ammonia, calcium, all that sort of thing in the possible water influencing phosphorus removal more than the rate of algal growth or uptake by the, by the algal biomass. So anybody who's interested, I encourage you to have a look at phosphorus to get a better understanding of, of that there, at least. There is, there, is a, um, there is a question here, um, Howard, that I think might apply from Justin uh, uh, at um, Melbourne Water. Yep. Uh, he's saying that how do we ensure macroalgae predominate over microalgae? For instance, um, is it easier to harvest the, harvest the biomass? Yep. Thanks, Justin, for that. Um, yep. I mean, there's been there's been a lot of um, obviously the, the microalgae are microscopic. They are difficult to remove. Um, they're no more difficult than suspended solids removal in other that has to be employed in other wastewater treatment systems. But nonetheless, they are difficult to remove. There's been quite a lot of work look been performed to look at whether use it we could use in, in inverted commas activated algae where we recycle the solids from a high rate algal pond where we've got desirable types of algae that uh, improve settling, uh, have improved settlement rates. That's work that's been uh, done in, in a few locations. The work that's been done to look at trying to enrich for filamentous algae, and, and, and Justin's quite right, they would be a lot easier to use. There is work gone on at uh, James Cook University with Udagonium species, uh, which is a, a macroalga grown in a pond like a high rate pond and can be removed by a filtration system. That's uh, currently being used, as I understand it, for treatment of prawn farm effluent in, uh, in um, the Philippines. It was developed at JCU by um, Rocky Denise. Well worth looking up the reference for that. Uh, I'm, I, I know he did some early publications that showed it might be um, applicable to uh, secondary treated wastewater, but I don't know of it being applied to secondary treated wastewater, only to prawn, prawn waste. But it is an, an active area of research to improve removal of, uh, of algae. Got a thanks. few more questions, so I'll keep keep moving along. Uh, but thanks, Justin. Thanks, Justin, for that question. Uh, Rob Richardson from Hydrogis in Adelaide has said, "Have you had an experience with nano algae? I believe these have much higher growth rates than normal algae." Ah, uh, well, I think we probably do have nano al well, well, nano algae. It's, it's often referred to as sort of picoplankton, where it's incredibly small, very small diameter. That was only the, the abundance of it in natural systems was only recently, rec well, relatively recently recognized because it was small enough to go through most filters people were using to, uh, to measure chlorophyll A in biomass. Um, yeah, they, 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 they may well have higher uptake rates, but when you come to the idea that you may have to remove them, you've got another problem there of another, another magnitude in size because you've, you've got such small particles uh, to remove. Um, there's one here from uh, Joseph uh, Marimoto in the um, Ministry of Water Resources in, in Tanzania. Uh, it's about the cost of applying this sort of technology. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting we go to the, 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 um, the, uh, the actual dollars, but we're talking larger amounts, smaller amounts. Um, well, the, the, I can talk from our experience in, in, in South Australia. So in, if we, in South Australia, any pond system that we want to employ has to have a um, high density polyethylene liner. It has to be lined, it has to have a geotextile. Right. Now the, the benchmark figure for that that we would use is about uh, 12 Australian dollars per square meter um, installed. So if you start to talk about ponds that could be uh, tens of square meters, you, tens of thousands of square meters, you're talking about a large cost just in the pond liner, let alone the earth moving. 
You could so, be up for tens of thousands of dollars there. So, so that's what we've based on. In, in a, if you if you want to go back and look at the previous talk, I did put some values up there of um, comparing a high rate pond cost to a waste stabilization pond that would be oh. treating the same volume of effluent, and it was done just on a percent on a percentage of cost compared to the waste stabilization pond. And our figures uh, show that it's between 40 and 50 percent cheaper to construct the pond, even though you have to put a paddle wheel in it for mixing. Yep. So, Joseph, maybe I, if I can suggest going to the um, the um, previous webinar, which uh, my colleague Joel has put up on the chat line. If you look at the chat line, there you'll see an AWS YouTube channel. It's the Australian Water School YouTube channel. That will take you to that last one and probably hit some of the costs that um, that Howard was talking about. Howard, would you mind if I ask one more question? If they're, they're coming through thick nope. and fast. I know you're Please only <laughs> part way through the, the presentation. So I don't want I don't want to stop you dead. But this one seems to have more um, more uh, applicability uh, to the what we're talking about right here and it's from Rajesh in the National Institute of Hydrology in Raw Key in India. Hi Rajesh, thanks for joining us. How much hey, how much P uptake is expected through micro microalgae treatment? In in what in, in uh, I haven't got numbers for grams or no. I mean what what we're looking at I mean you could do you can do a theoretical calculation you know from that um, that stoichiometry that I've produced in that yeah. equation yeah. and you can assume uh, if you know your dry weight of your algae and you know the amount of algae you're producing either in um, milligrams per litre. I mean, there's a debate about how you measure algal production in these systems. Traditionally, it's been compared to a standard agricultural system where we talk about tons per hectare or grams per metre squared of, of land or pond. So you'll find in literature grams per metre squared. So if it's dry matter, you can use that stoichiometry to calculate the amount of phosphorus you might be able, you might expect theoretically to be able to remove by the microalgal biomass you've produced. That gives you some measure about whether you're in the right ballpark with the measurements you've got from your filtered wastewater, what's, in, what's left in the wastewater. And as I say, the, the phosphorus uh, removal, you know, is various. It's, it's probably much broader than you see for nitrogen removal in the range of values for phosphorus removal. And our Kingston on Murray system is about, I think it's about 16% we see from inlet to outlet. Uh, whereas other systems we've operated and we, we're working on pig slurry as well, we can see removals there of between 60, 50 and 60 percent removal of phosphorus. And I think that's a comment more on the, the nature of the inorganic chemistry of the wastewater you're dealing with and the high pH and ammonia being able to cause precipitation in those flocks. And that's why I think we've probably, as um, a research community, paid um, not enough attention to phosphorus removal to understand how it really, how it really uh, occurs. Okay, so where we're going now is I'm going to move into um, the questions people ask about uh, the performance. So, you know, this is the biochemical oxygen demand removal. Uh, this is from a paper that we uh, published this year, and it's about um, the, 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 for, for the disposal of the final treated effluent in South Australia generally goes for irrigation of trees, of woodlots. Uh, it's it's a low risk disposal pathway where we don't have a lot of ex don't have potential exposure increased exposure to the public so they're not going to be exposed to potentially disease causing organisms. Uh, it's a, a relatively uh, benign way of, of of disposing of the treated waste. In Australia, we're in a bit of a situation, a beneficial situation where we've got relatively poor soils, low in organic matter content, so. Putting in uh, algal biomass with uh, higher carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus is seen as an advantage to uh, to uh, soil um, structure and uh, and composition. So when we look at uh, biochemical oxygen demand here, our, our um, mean inlet is about 180, and you can see in the first pond we get uh, down to below 20 milligrams a litre, which is a requirement. High rate pond two. I'm not suggesting we should run these systems in series. It was just the way this validation was done. High rate pond two, the BOD goes up slightly. We think that's because of the release of um, polysaccharides by the algae and other byproducts of algal and bacterial growth in the system, but it's not a significant increase. And suspended solids obviously increase because we're growing algae. We're increasing the suspended solids because of algal growth and consequently its ability increases. And there's a measure there of the amount of algae based on um, milligrams chlorophyll A uh, per litre. What I'm keen to get onto, because we were talking about that ultimate disposal pathway being uh, reuse. And of course, pathogen removal is the um, is one of the key components of that. And it's certainly one of the key components that the regulator is interested in, is how do we, how does our system remove, um, how does it perform as a disinfection system? 
I showed this slide before, but it's, it's just uh, it, it, good to get an understanding of why we're interested in DO and pH. So we've got these wavelengths across the top of, uh, of UVB being the most um, direct photo inactiv inactivation. That is, it, it causes a polymerization of the, uh, of the pathogen's DNA, stops replication. Uh, that's, that's a direct response to irradiation with UVB, short wavelength UVB. And then UVA is a little more, little more complex in that there uh, is an interaction with uh, photosensitizing substances in the waste, in, in, the, in this case, in the first part, the middle part where it's endogenous, the photosensitizers are actually in a bacterial cell. So this might be within the, cell, within the body of the E. coli. You have a stimulation with UVA produces a reactive uh, a, a sensitizer that's now active. It interacts with oxygen and it produces reactive oxygen species, free radicals, which then interact with the DNA and, 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 and damage the DNA and stop replication. That's very difficult to measure, difficult um, process to, um, to, to actually make measurements on. Where we have made a contribution, and again, I, 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 I referred to this in the previous uh, webinar, is with UVA, which is an interesting one from a wastewater perspective, because in UVA, we get exogenous photooxidation. And that's where the sensitizers are actually out, outside the cell in the wastewater. And this is a mechanism that contributes to the removal of pathogenic viruses and coliphages in the system if you're using coliphage as the surrogate for a pathogenic virus. So again, the UVA interacts with the sensitizer. That then interacts with the oxygen that's present at high concentration in the wastewater, produces a reactive oxygen species, which then damages the, um, usually our, our belief is it damages the capsid, the outer coat of the membrane of the virus, and it stops it uh, uh, reproducing. And that's why you see um, die off. So you can see, when you look at um, the, the, the mixing and the circulating the wastewater through these uh, UV environments, you can increase the rate of um, die off of the pathogens and the indicator organisms you're using as a, a surrogate measure of pathogen removal. And we have, um, we, we are required, uh, no, understanding these mechanisms, part of the validation, this again is this, in this paper that was produced this year, in association with Australian Water Quality Centre. So to get these systems validated by the regulator, we're required to have them validated independently by a, a, a nationally accredited testing facility, which was Australian Water Quality Centre. And I talked about this in the last, in the previous uh, webinar, we're required to uh, validate these ponds in winter. So we're validating them in the worst possible case scenario. We're required to take uh, 10 inlet samples, 10 outlet samples, and we used E. coli as a surrogate measure for pathogenic bacteria and FRNA bacteriophage as a surrogate for pathogenic viruses. Um, we, my group operated the ponds and they were independently validated by another lab. And th these are the data from that. And you can see that we're looking here at log reduction values. So in our guidelines, we're required to look at the log reduction inlet to outlet. So in this, in series, we're talking about the wastewater coming in, round about 10 to the 6 E. coli coming in, and we get nearly two log removals in the pond, first pond, another 1.5 in the second pond, and the mean log removal is about three of the ponds in series. These ponds were operated at 0.3 meters depth, five-day residence time. So all in all, this is a 10-day residence time because these were operating in, in uh, series. So we're getting a 3.3 log reduction with a 10-day residence time. But the regulator makes it even more difficult because they regulate on the basis of the fifth percentile. So that, in effect, is the, the least removal that you get in 20 samples gives you the fifth percentile. And in that case, we're just over, we're 1.2 in the first, 0.3 in the second, and nearly two overall. Uh, because viruses are probably carry a higher risk in the sense that uh, you may only need one uh, activate, uh, one infective viral particle to cause a, uh, a, a, a disease in a susceptible person. Uh, viruses are often held uh, in higher regard than E. coli in terms of regulation. So we'll, again, we're looking for over one log removal in the treatment system, we get 1.5. Again, uh, the mean is nearly uh, 2.3. So this satisfies the, uh, the regulator that this system gives um, adequate performance in terms of viral removal as a, as a treatment system. 
And in the end, the, the outcome of this uh, was that uh, we, we got uh, validation of the system. What we've gone on, because of our understanding of this system, we now have a microbial die-off model for high-rate algal ponds. So one of, the, one of the benefits we have is when a community signs up to a community wastewater management system that includes septic tanks, the individual householder signs up to a, 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 a desludging of the, pe of the uh, septic tank every four years. That leads to really consistent influent quality to our high rate algal ponds from that community. And we've looked at other communities and we've found no statistical difference in wastewater quality across about 11 communities with septic tanks because they're, they, they are, I believe, they're, uh, they're actually uh, managed. We have intermittent feed to the system. So the system isn't continue, the high rate algal pond isn't continuously being fed. It's fed uh, from a sump with a, with a submersible pump and the pump comes on according to uh, liquid height in the tank controlled by float switches. So we get intermittent feed. And at Kingston on Murray, that's about, um, about 12 to 14,000 liters come in a day, and it's fed in roughly six, six feed cycles, each of about 2,000 liters. And of course, we'll get diurnal changes in, in die-off uh, in the light compared to the dark. Um, what we've developed is this model in conjunction with a mathematician, Simon Williams, and my PhD student, Paul Young. And we've got a pond simulator where we can, we can put in the depth, the area of the pond, the depth of the pond's operating, that's variable. We have, we've got um, a lot of experience where we've looked at um, laboratory-derived um, die-off rate constants for UVA, UVB, and visible. Uh, we can uh, include those rate constants we've got for various organisms. We can look at the turbidity and the effective depth that these uh, irradiants penetrate to. We can put in the concentration of organisms coming into the system, and then we can run the model and it will give us outputs from the system and what we get at steady state. And I'm just going to show you one of the outputs uh, from this. So this is, this is a system, this is one where we're looking at survivors. Obviously, we start off at an input at about 10 to the 6. Uh, e. coli coming in and then this is the number of um, additions we've had to the system so each one of these is we've had additions in between and we've also had diurnal cycles in between and what we see is the sawtooth pattern is the the uh, higher the fewer survivors is associated with um, daytime removal and there's a slight increase over night time we can change that depending on how we feed the pond um, we can change it according to the uh, number of daylight hours, etc. And it gives us an idea of how our ponds, uh, how our ponds going to perform. We can do this for uh, FRNA phage as well. And we're looking, part of the guidelines requires that we're below um, 10 to the 4 uh, per, uh, E. coli per 100 ml in the discharge. And we can demonstrate we can meet that from our, um, our uh, microbial die-off model. And the net result of all the work on the independent validation and again, I've talked about the validation in previous webinars, is that we get a design guideline for high-rate algal ponds, which are about to be published in South Australia. These guidelines are, the, the validation is consistent with national guidelines, so there's really no reason why this technology couldn't be easily transferred within other um, places in, in Australia. I'm quite happy to talk with people about that. These guidelines will be, we're just reviewing all the guidelines for community wastewater management schemes, and they'll be published again in a revised form in uh, sometime this year. It's in the final stages of revision for the statewide guidelines. And then that, that has led now to a further development in South Australia with these pond systems. So they're now accepted as an alternate to um, the, the five-cell waste sterilization pond systems, which were much larger and much more expensive to construct. And the first one that we're looking at now is, um, is Peterborough, which is currently being constructed. And we're talking here about a, a township in the uh, mid-north of South Australia. It's got about uh, 1,100 connections. It's uh, been designed or has been designed for uh, 470 cubic meters per day of uh, wastewater flow. This town hasn't, been, uh, hasn't got septic tanks uh, in, the, in the garden. We're not going to use septic tanks. So we're taking the benefit of uh, anaerobic pretreatment in the system. That's been designed with a four-day hydraulic retention time. And then we're constructing two uh, 5,000 square meter ponds, which will operate in parallel. 
depth is going to be 0.3 meters. And as a result of the validation, the validation is for a 10 day hydraulic retention time. I think that's probably uh, very conservative and we could reduce that significantly, but we've gone with a 10 day uh, residence time with this validation. The final effluent is going to be reused for green space irrigation, golf course irrigation around the township. And it's about to be completed at the end of this, this, this month um, is completion date. So this is, this is the area of the township. This used to be uh, the blue square is where the plant's going to go. That, that used to be a landfill um, uh, site for uh, solid waste management. It's owned by the council and the pond system is being constructed there. So this pond system is, has been designed by one of our local um, consultant engineers, Walbridge, Walbridge Gilbert Aztec. And you can see there's the two uh, anaerobic ponds, each feeding one of the high rate ponds um, with, a, as I said, a hydraulic retention of time of four days. It's a meandering channel design. Uh, we now have a model that will work out, uh, calculate and provide uh, the energy requirement for mixing and for sizing the, uh, the paddle wheel for um, the different size ponds and different, different numbers of channels and bends and all those sort of hydraulic things that a microbiologist doesn't really understand. But we have that model for sizing the pond system. Uh, and then the, the treated waste water goes into the storage lagoons, the balanced storage lagoons prior to uh, release for irrigation. Um, and the last time I visited, which was about uh, April this year, uh, this is about this is even further away. This is probably about 350 kilometers away from Adelaide. Um, we had uh, the the construction was going on well. This is the just an uh, an example of the uh, the paddle wheel installation that's involved in that that system. It's been uh, produced by a, a local company in South Australia, and it, it's also uh, the paddle wheel installation. This is all the gantry system is being provided for access, but also for uh, remote monitoring equipment for DOPH, uh, temperature, conductivity, uh, turbidity measurement on site for um, delivery to a server and then gaining the information from the cloud and being able to look at how the system's performing and managing the system at distance. So it'll be a very nicely uh, monitored and, and uh, validated system at scale. And where I was going before, the last time I visited, as I said in April, this was the uh, balanced storage area had been excavated that is now completed and lined, but you can see it's a, an earthen uh, pond that will have a geotextile liner and an HDPE liner for um, effluent storage prior to, uh, to release. And I've very quickly finished my 10 slides. I would really like to acknowledge this, this, this sort of research um, done at scale and remotely, uh, it, it depends on a lot of other people coming, to, uh, coming in support and I really can't speak highly enough of Loxton Wakery District Council and the Local Government Association of South Australia for supporting this research over a, over a 10 year period uh, to get it from original concept to um, implementation and acceptance has been a, a huge uh, effort and it's been great support from uh, local government. And then we have um, the Department of Health, the uh, independent validators, the engineers who've been designing the system for Peterborough and uh, Peterborough District Council. And again, there's companies that are involved in, Demotech is a local supplier of remote sensing, which has been a tremendous support. And uh, my PhD students and postdocs who've been involved long-term and, and hung in there on the system. So I'll finish it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's great, Howard. That's, it, it is an incredible thing. You can have the, all the right science, but without all these people, like you say, uh, involved, it, it makes it, it it's important to have everybody on board. Press the Q and A. Many people have done that, so we'll get stuck into that right now. I reckon. Yeah, I've got I've got the Q and A open, uh, Trevor. For the oh, uh, you can see what's going on. Yeah, you pick up pick up one of those, Rob. There's a few there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the first one we've got from Pradeep about um, ensure human health and safety for reusing this water. We're really in in Australia. I think we've been well served by our reuse guidelines. I'd encourage you to go on the website and look at that. You could find it through. Uh, the uh, National Health Medical Research Council website. If you put in Australian reuse or reclamation guidelines, you'll find a very useful document uh, that really um, has uh, led to the World Health Organization adopting a similar approach. So it was really yeah. ahead of its time. Um, 
Disinfection byproducts, no, we don't look at those because we don't chlorinate at the end. Uh, it's a disposal pathway. Um, yep. UVA and UVB, you can actually buy really quite expensive sensors that will um, you can stick, you can put on a pole and put the pole with the sensor down through the depth of water and record the uh, UV penetration at depth. That's right. Um, that's Parvez. Thanks a lot for that. That's question. Parvez. That's, yep. that's a, a Californian company I think we use. Sure, um, sure. How does the technology address uncertainty? Uh, I'm not quite sure where we're going with that, but uncertainty, we, we, the, the uncertainty from the point of view of disinfection is measured. We, if you read the guidelines, there's a well-developed approach to risk assessment and risk management, incorporating uh, disability-adjusted life years for various organisms. That's in the guidelines. I'd encourage you to read them. Um, how, well, that's a great question about how, how is the technology uh, friendly to the environment. Yeah, Joseph. Um, mm. Well, we're, we're removing nitrogen and phosphorus into the biomass. One of the things that we're really interested in now, and I, I debated whether to include it in the uh, seminar, is we're currently looking at the rate of transport of the nutrients we apply around um, uh, eucalypt trees are usually grown in, in South Australia. And we're looking at how nitrogen and phosphorus moves through the soil profiles. And the other question we're looking at is how do we release, um, how do the algae break down and release carbon dioxide to the environment? How do we change soil respiration rates and what the implication might be uh, associated with that? Uh, what do we use as a photosynthesizer? We, we didn't. It's naturally occurring organic matter present within the, within the wastewater. Um, I, did, I did expand on this in a previous webinar where we, to measure the role of photosynthesizers, you actually use a quencher. And one of the quenchers is um, the amino acid histidine, and you can do incubations with and without histidine. And the difference between the incubations will tell you how much contribution there is by the photosensitizer and UVA. So that's a that's a, uh, an experimental method. One one more thing, uh, Howard, is that there's another another little question we'd like to ask everyone, uh, and what you, what your interest is in this topic. It just helps us as we plan ahead for future times like this. So it's coming up there in the screen now. Thanks a lot. Uh, Joel, uh, regulation, planning, building, operating. If you could give us a quick answer of that, we'll shoot back a, a question to everybody. So, yep, that'd be really good if you could um, uh, go to that. That's great. And there's a few more questions up here from Pradeep, Rob Richardson and Anna. We're, we're coming to those now. So you see that one there by Pradeep. Yep. For, develop, for developing or underdeveloped economies, uh, the treatment and reuse methods should be of low cost and low energy consuming. So yep. the scenario is different. I think, they think that that's what you're on about, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Pradeep. And I think uh, people in this area will, will know that there's uh, also the potential of gaining energy. Uh, when we had the um, what I would call the algal biotechnology bubble, where we were talking about biofuels, hmm. uh, one route to this, for instance, you, you can if you can uh, thicken your effluent and then the simple technology would be to put the, the algal biomass through an anaerobic digester you would get methane from that algal biomass. That's done in Adelaide with uh, algae coming off uh, waste stabilization ponds already. Uh, it's another area, and it was an interest that we had with uh, Melbourne Water was using these systems just to produce biomass for energy, for a sustainable energy source to operate the processes. And we're, 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 we're really aware of this, and that's why we've moved to looking at solar panels and battery storage. And we're continuing research on that area where we reduce the amount of energy input required for operation of the process. And it's been a long, it's been a long standing issue about waste stabilization ponds have zero energy input, produce a poorer quality effluent and are much more variable in their performance, as opposed to putting a simple paddle wheel in and how we can do that energy efficiently and low cost. Well, that's on that point of the paddle wheel, Rob from uh, Hydrodis has said, does one paddle wheel give sufficient agitation for the whole process, such as Peterborough, as it would appear the flow would stratify during the process? Good question, Rob. I mean, we believe from the, the modeling that's been done and the approach to it that you get significant benefit from the bends uh, rather than having, uh, I, I was quite keen to build it in this way rather than have it what we would call a single pass donut shaped uh, high rate pond where you only have one channel divider and it just goes round and round in circles. I think by making it, making it uh, a multi-channel approach, it makes it more compact and it also adds agitation to every time you change 180 degrees, you get additional turbulence around the bends. And that's what we're looking for. But um, it's an interesting question. And it's one that we'll be looking at at Peterborough. So Peterborough not only uh, is being, uh, has been agreed for implementation, it's also 
it's agreed that we will be able to continue work on Peterborough on a larger system and look at a bigger system and how it performs. So that's quite exciting for PhD students and anybody who wants to join us to yep, do research yep. with us. Yep, that's a good plug, a good plug. And, <laughs> and you can speak to Howard by just uh, emailing us here at Icewarm and we'll certainly put you on to Howard for sure. Yep. Uh, Anna from WA, uh, a research scientist in WA, has asked if algae is to be used as a fertiliser, how would you suggest managing the heavy metals that are in the wastewater? Yeah, good question. I mean, I suppose I, I will um, I would I would do a body swerve on that one really because <laughs> where we are in these rural communities, there's the, the heavy metals you'd expect to be in there from the wastewater might come. We 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 have in Adelaide, for instance, problems with cupra solvency of copper pipes, so we would see some copper coming in because the pipes are dissolving. But generally, in these rural communities, we don't see a lot of heavy metals. Uh, the heavy metals that in 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 where I've operated it for pig slurry. Uh, they actually feed zinc and copper to pigs as growth promoters, would you believe? And we do see uh, zinc and copper, and that's absorbed to the algal cells. Uh, that is an issue. Um, but I don't think the level of absorption and the amount of algae that you, amount of uh, heavy metals you see absorbed. Um, we did rat feeding trials many years ago in the 1980s and saw no adverse, advan uh, adverse effects of the level of copper and zinc that was adhered to, uh, adhering to algal cells. But in metropolitan environments where you do have industry, it is something to be aware of and something that should be considered. Well, we've come to an end. And thanks, everybody, for, for participating. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to have a look at the uh, any of the webinars we're doing here at Icewarm, just log on to that, that URL there, the YouTube um, link. Uh, and there's plenty more free webinars coming up. As you can see, there's four of them there in, uh, in groundwater modelling in the Manage Act for Recharge in Mining, and then a, a couple from Bureau of Meteorology, which will be most interesting. Uh, along with that, of course, there's online courses in um, in water water modelling in HECRAS by Cray Price. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We're so glad you could, and uh, we hope to see you again in, in the near future. Thanks again, Howard, for your time. We so appreciate it. Bye for now, everybody.